Jeff. Um, I'm pretty informal, so if you guys have questions as we're going through this, feel free to shout them out. Um, been working for uh, Children's Services. Uh, it's one of the departments inside of Job and Family Services for just about 19 years now. Um, most of that time, about 17 years of it, I spent going out and investigating reports of abuse and neglect. Somewhere around 3,000 reports of abuse and neglect that I I've gone out on over the years. Um, started off in our sexual abuse unit uh, where we dealt with sexual abuse, ser serious injuries, fatalities, and then I went to our after hours unit. So in the middle of the night while things happened in the community, we were going out at two o'clock in the morning and making sure kids were safe. So. Um, the 241 Kids Hotline, that's where I actually worked at nighttime. So, um, Job and Family Services houses several departments. Children's Services is one of them. We also uh, deal with food stamps, Medicaid, uh, child support, workforce development, um, child care, and cash assistance. For our Children's Services division, um, we serve about 17,000 in the community yearly. Um, our 241 Kids Hotline, we get about 63,000 phone calls each year. Um, it's not staffed by secretaries or anything. Those are actual social workers who go out to the field. And, and uh, the daytime workers, they used to go out to the field and assess safety. The, the after hours workers, they do both. Um, we get, um, out of that 63,000 phone calls, we actually take about 6,000 reports each year of abuse and neglect. So a lot of those other calls can be things like, uh, folks ask, asking us for resources in the community. Uh, every week I got several people asking, what, how old does my kid have to be to be left home alone? Um, so lots of things like that, lots of different questions. Um, and we get calls on our open active cases too from other providers that we're dealing with. Um, about 1,900 kids, and these are all 2013 numbers, uh, about 1,900 children involved in substantiated or indicated cases of abuse and neglect. Those are cases where we believe abuse or neglect occurred or we, we found some type of corroborating evidence to uh, verify that it occurred. Um, currently about 1,700 kids are currently in a paid placement. So that's some type of foster care, residential center, or um, uh, we don't pay kinship placements. I think about 400 are currently in kinship placements. And about 250 of our children are up for uh, adoption at any given point in time. So we actually have a, our own website for our kids that are up for adoption. So everybody in here is gonna be a, a teacher, right? Are you guys in your final year? No, not even close? Next year? Very good, very good. Well, you'll be joining the ranks of mandated reporters here. Um, there's about uh, 30 something different uh, occupational fields that are all mandated reporters. Basically, what you guys are required to do is by law, to report any suspicion of child abuse and neglect immediately. Um, you don't have to prove it. You don't have to investigate it. In fact, most of the time we prefer you didn't. If a kid comes to you and says something that is concerning or has an injury on them that is concerning and you say, hey, how'd that happen? And they say, mom did it. That's the time to call us. We've got enough information there to get, go on. If for some reason you call and we're missing a piece, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, they may give you a directive of a specific question to ask that may make or break whether or not we are going to uh, take that as a report of abuse or neglect. Um, the uh, ranks of uh, mandated reporters include things like uh, social workers, GALs, CASAs, um, therapists, counselors, anybody who works for a school. Um, like I said, there's about 35 occupational fields. Um, if, and this happens a lot these days, guys, multiple people are involved in taking a report. So the kid comes up and they've got a black eye or maybe some other injuries and they tell the teacher like a little tidbit. And then the teacher sends them to the nurse. And then the nurse tells the assistant principal. And the assistant principal says, okay, I'm the one that's gonna call this in. Anybody see a problem with that? Everybody played telephone when you were a kid? Yeah, what happens by the third person down the line? Details are missing, things change. Um, so if multiple people are involved in getting information, making sure they're all t either together in the room, conference calling, we do that all the time, people pass the phone back and forth, or everybody collaborates and makes sure everybody's got all the right information and, and gets to us. Because there are times, I'm sure, reports have been screened out because the information by that third person who didn't talk to the kid, didn't see the child, 
has a vague description of what happened doesn't get to us. And, and, and it, we, don't, we don't get the impact from that report that it should have. Um, so making sure that all of the information gets to us is very important. Um, we are a 24-hour unit, so any time during the day, and most of these phone calls, guys, and I know you guys are busy in school. You've got a couple minutes in between classes. You've got um, things that you have to take care of during that time. Most of these phone calls, guys, are like five, 10 minutes, maybe 15 if it's very, very detail-oriented. Um, it's very important for us to get the information earlier in the day where we can make a good decision on what to do because if the child is reporting something extremely sensitive, what do you think of the likelihood they're gonna report it if we go out to the home at 4.30 in the afternoon in front of their parents? It, it kind of goes down, doesn't it? Some of these things that we deal with, sexual abuse, um, domestic violence, uh, things that, that are gonna be making a lifelong impact on these children, if we can't get that information from them, if they don't tell us, we can't substantiate it and we can't really do much with it. So um, we are allowed by law to go see kids in school if they're gonna be either in danger while they're at school or in danger upon returning home we can see them without their parents' permission. We then have to go tell their parents that we did this and address that with them, but um, we are allowed to go see the kids at school. Um, upon making a report, you guys being mandated reporters are the only ones that can call us back and say, hey, I'd like to know some details going on in this. You guys are working with the kid many more hours of the day and the week than we are. You guys are seeing these kids 30, 35 hours a week in school. Um, we are supposed to mail you guys a letter. If for some reason that gets lost in the shuffle, just know that you can call us and say, hey, I'm a teacher, I called this report in, I would like to know some basic things. First off, did you guys initiate a report? Did you guys send somebody out to talk to these folks? Second, is this child safe? Um, you can also find out if we um, initiated any type of legal action. So if we did anything uh, with the court to make sure this child's safe, we can tell you guys that. So fairly free exchange of information, which is significant because all of our records are confidential. Like, you know how people can call in and, and get a police report and say, what'd you guys do when you were out there? And you can actually get the hard copy of the report. Without a court order, nobody's getting our records. And, and somebody in the community asking for that, that's not gonna get approved. So um, you guys are the only ones that are gonna be able to get some of that information. So who calls us? Professionals in the community by far are our biggest source of information. About two thirds of our calls are from professionals. Um, Non-professionals, so we're talking family members, family friends, um, make up uh, less than, uh, about 20%. Um, unclassified, sometimes people don't leave their name, sometimes they wish to remain anonymous, um, not a problem. Uh, one thing I do want to talk to you guys about, does any, anybody have a work in a school where there's a policy that the teachers are not allowed to call the, without talking to the principal first? There are a couple school districts around here that do that. Um, it's not up to the principal to investigate any child abuse or neglect. They have no authority in the state of Ohio to do that, and it doesn't meet your mandate. If you have a suspicion, not if the principal does, but if you do, you have the legal obligation to call. I have had teachers call me and say, hey, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose my job if I make this report because we have a policy in our school that says all of this has to go by the principal and the principal said not to report it. We've had teachers call on their way home in their cars and say I wish to remain anonymous but I'm a teacher and, and this is the policy. I'm okay with that. If you guys have to make sure you guys are employed if you guys run into a problem like that, you can tell us because we do education in the school. We talk to the school boards, we talk to the principals, we have contact with these folks and we can iron out some problems if we see any. Um, but I've seen it over the years in multiple schools, it's not just one or two. So if that happens, there's a way around it. You can still meet your mandate. You won't be able to call back if you don't leave your name. If you don't leave your name and you try to call back and say I'm a mandated reporter and I made this report and our report says anonymous caller, we won't release any information to you. But we'll still take all the information and do what we need to with it. So there's a way around problems like that. Um, law enforcement call, these are our professionals who call in our reports. Law enforcement call in a little over 20% of our calls. Um, they go out all the time. 
doing well child checks, they find something, they call us. Most of the time they're things, that, if they're calling us, most of the time they're things that we need to respond to fairly quickly. Um, education professionals, about 16% over the years. Uh, mental health professionals, almost half. So a lot of our cases involve some type of mental illness. Um, social services, so other social workers not classified in the, uh, either in the education system or the mental health field make up about 7% of our calls. So what happens when people call two for one kids? We initially screen these calls, we ask a lot of questions, and I'm gonna give you a little preview of some of the questions that we ask, um, just so you're prepared for them. Um, but at the screening, at the initial, at the hotline, we screen it to decide, A, is this a report of abuse, neglect, or dependency of a child? Do we need to respond to this? Um, then we decide how fast do we need to respond? We have four response times. First one is priority one, you have to be there within one hour. Those, are, those tend to be very immediate. Usually the police are on scene waiting for us and we need to be there in a very short period of time. Um, our second priority is same day response. Something bad is going on and somebody needs to be there today but not necessarily in one hour. Uh, our third response is a 24 hour response and then we have our our lowest priority, and that's a 72-hour response if we can call somebody and make sure the kid's safe right now. And that could be something like mom called us and said, um, dad injured the child on a visit last weekend. I've got the kid, the kid's not going back for a week. We might do something like that and say, okay, um, we might uh, call mom back just to make sure everything's okay and, and we could initiate that within 72 hours. So when we reasonably believe the child's safe, we can do something like that. <clears throat> so types of things they're going to ask you, basic demographics. Child's name, you may or may not have their date of birth, you may just have their age, that's okay. Um, if you've got their date of birth available, definitely um, get it. Addresses. Um, our folks tend to move a lot. People that we deal with, they, they tend to move several times in a year. Um, so make sure the current address that you have in the file is the correct one. Otherwise, we send a worker to that one and nobody's there, and then we start looking for them. And that gets, it takes a lot longer to find the kid. Um, we wanna know about household members. We wanna know who else is there. We do, when we screen these cases in, we do a background check on every single person that lives in that home. Find out their history with us, their criminal history, anything we can about these folks because we send our workers out to these homes and we like to know if they've done something violent to somebody else for our own safety and, and to help us with our assessment for the kid. Um, and any information about what we call the alleged maltreater. Whoever did this to the child, we wanna know as much about them as possible. Especially, do they live in this home and do they have access to this child? For the uh, alleged maltreatment, we wanna know the type of maltreatment. And that's just basically, is it physical abuse? Is it neglect of uh, supervision? Is it neglect of food uh, for um, basic needs through lack of food or lack of shelter? Um, where the maltreatment occurred. Anybody have an idea why we need to know where it occurred? We investigate reports based on where the child resides. If a child lives in Hamilton County, I don't care if the incident happened in Tennessee. I have to be able to go out and physically see the child. But if the incident happened in Tennessee and it's something that would be um, a crime, then law enforcement in Tennessee have to investigate that part of it. So jurisdiction by law enforcement is wherever the incident occurred. Um, condition of the child, any injuries, is the child fearful of going home, um, has there been few, uh, past maltreatment, has anything happened before this, um, have we, has it been ongoing domestic violence for three years, the kid's just now telling us, or has there been lack of food, lack of housing, and domestic violence, again we want to know the history as much as we possibly can, um, and how long the maltreatment went on, if, if it was an incident where somebody picked up the child and struck them one time, or whether it's something that went on for 15 minutes and the child has multiple injuries, and again, make, helps us make our decision on how fast we need to respond, does the child need to be seen by EMS personnel you know, in a short period of time, um, helps us make good decisions to have good information. So child functioning, we wanna know how this child acts day to day. We wanna know what their behavior is, what their relationships are with other folks, um, how they communicate. Um, if they have a, uh, uh, 
if they are limited in English proficiency. I want to know all of that information because that's going to be, do I need to bring an interpreter with me? Um, for me, I have a hard time with um, speech impediments, so I really need to be in the right frame of mind. I got to calm myself down and, and listen very, very closely because speech impediments throw me off a little bit, um, depending on how significant they are. Um, general mood and temperament, motor skills, all of these things seem like basic things. These things tell us how vulnerable a child is. If I've got a kid who is, um, his general mood and temperament is very, very excitable, um, yelling, screaming, running around, slamming doors in the home, and then I've got another kid who's real calm, demeanor, and, and easygoing, and easy to talk to, which kid do you think is going to be more vulnerable? The first or the second? First one, right? They're going to get the attention and they're going to annoy the parents. They're going to cause the, the frustration level in the home to go up. So that's why we ask questions about child functioning. For adult functioning, I want to know what kind of self-control the parent has. And if they're coming into the school um, screaming and out of control and uh, using, uh, making uh, in inappropriate threats um, to the child or the staff, again, that's an indication this person is not in control of their behavior. Um, I want to know what kind of problem solving that you guys may not have a lot of this information. If we don't ask it, we won't get it. So that's why we go, we ask enough questions, hopefully to exhaust your knowledge of this family. Because if we don't, we're going to miss pieces. So don't feel bad if you have to say, I, I really don't know that one. I've only been working with the family a week. That's okay. We expect to get to that point sooner or later. But if you've known the family for three years, I, I expect a lot more information than the police officer that met them 10 minutes ago. So we, we, we understand things like that. Um, if there are any suspicions of substance abuse or mental health issues, all of those things under the adult functioning, they tell me how protective a parent can be or will be. So if I've got a parent that's not thinking rationally, that is not in control of their behavior, how protective do you think that parent's going to be? compared to the one who is rational, who doesn't have a criminal history, who's not using drugs. Again, that, that tells us how protective or not protective a parent can be. Um, parenting practices, you may or may not know some of these things, but we want to know how satisfied they are as being a parent. Um, do they have empathy for the child? If, if the mom, if the child is now saying, um, you know, mom, my, your boyfriend beat me and has injuries all over him, did the mom dismiss this? Or did she empathize with the child and, and show that she's protect, protecting this kid? Um, decision making in parenting practices. When is it okay to leave this kid home alone? What types of chores are appropriate for this child? What types of discipline are appropriate for this child? Those are the kind of things that we're looking for in those categories. So what is child maltreatment? Um, any abuse or neglect of a child under the age of 18 by the parent, the caregiver, or somebody else in a custodial role. Uh, about every year, there's about 3.4, uh, 3.5 million reports across the United States of abuse and neglect of children. Um, Ohio had about 166,000. Um, every year, around 1,500 kids die as a result of being abused or neglected. So the statute says uh, this is an abused child. Child that exhibits evidence of, of any physical or mental injury or death inflicted other than by accidental means or at variance with the history given. So we're not talking about the kid that fell off the bike and, and got scuffed up on the, on the concrete. We're talking about somebody who inflicted harm upon this child or you're seeing an injury that has three linear marks going across the kid's neck and back and face and the kid goes, I fell down. Okay, that's that injury is not consistent with the history being given for it. So if you see something and, and the kid's giving you a story that you don't believe, you now have a suspicion of child abuse neglect and you're perfectly within your mandate to report that. Um, also because of the act of the parent or custodian, they, they suffer physical or mental injury that harms or threatens to harm the child's health or welfare. Um, when we talk about threatens to harm the child's health, we can talk about things like domestic violence in the home. Um, the child doesn't have to necessarily be hit with something, but they can still be what we call endangered. 
So we've had kids that have ended up in the hospital. I had one where they were fighting and somebody threw a saw blade at one of the other parents and it bounced off something and hit the kid. Um, we've had parents fighting literally while holding the baby and the baby was injured. So domestic violence is something that we've, we've always taken as endangerment to children. So they don't necessarily have to get hit, but the potential exists and we will investigate it um, due to the threat. Um, we also have parents who take a swing at the kid um, and miss. If our, our, first off, are parents allowed to use a belt or a paddle or something to discipline their kids? Does anybody know? Who says yes, they can? Nobody. They are allowed to use physical discipline. They are even allowed to use an implement. Where we draw the line is, is there a serious injury to this child? Um, I always use the analogy, if it left a, a, a nickel-sized bruise on a 10-year-old's behind, that's not going to involve us if they leave more significant injuries. And where that line is depends on the size of the injury, the location of the injury, how old the child is, um, and what they did. So, but sometimes there isn't an injury. If a parent takes a belt and swings at a kid and misses, it's hard for me to say, okay, that, that definitely would have left an injury. But if they swing the belt buckle side at the kid's face and miss, I can consider that endangerment because the likelihood that that belt buckle was going to leave a significant injury on the child's face threatens the, the health and safety of that child. I can make that argument. Um, mental injury is always interesting. Um, tends to be one of the fewest reports that we take. In my day as, as a worker, most, of day, most years, we took about three to five reports of emotional abuse. Nowadays, I think we're up to about 50. Um, is it illegal for a parent to cuss at a child? Anybody know? It's not illegal, is it? Where do you think the line might be? Now we're headed in the right direction. Um, if their behavior causes the child to be sad and cry, probably not going to involve us. If that behavior on that child now causes that child to be suicidal or homicidal, now we've, we've crossed a, a very big line, right? So it tends to be cases like that. We have, we've had cases where, and children have different levels of re resiliency, right? You can have one kid where this kid here you can yell and, and cuss at, and it may not affect them that much. They may not be happy about it, but it may not have a serious long, lifelong impact. Whereas this other kid, same behavior, might cause that same child to be suicidal. So emotional abuse is based on the behavior and the effect on the child. Um, physical abuse. These are some numbers. Um, how often we, uh, how many of the uh, reports that we get for physical abuse, emotional, and sexual abuse. You'll see the last three years um, that we've recorded um, for emotional abuse, literally jumped in 2010. Um, now we're up, we were up in the teens in 2012, and now we're up to 50 as of 2014. So significant jump in, in what we used to take for that. Um, physical abuse um, goes back and forth. 2,700 in 2012, 3,600 in 2014. Um, little bit of a jump there. Sex abuse pretty much remains about the same almost every year, somewhere between seven and 900 cases a year of sex abuse. Um, as far as physical abuse, we talked about inflicted serious physical injury, um, emotional maltreatment. Um, we're looking at that pattern of behavior by the adult and how it affects the kid. And sexual abuse. Um, does anybody know what the age of consent in the state of Ohio is? Good. Most, most people don't know that. Um, because it's not actually spelled out anywhere. You have to look through all the statutes and go, okay, kind of 16 looks like the cutoff here. Um, you guys are all early childhood ed, right? Mm -hmm. What are the ages of the kids you guys are going to be working with? Nine. Nine. Um, are any of your uh, kids going to have younger or older siblings that you may see and come in contact with? Um, so the use of force, coercion, or threat by an adult to engage a child in sexual conduct or, or activity. And I'll also add to that you can have child-on-child -child sexual abuse. You can have a 15-year-old sexually abusing another child. Um, 
depending on the behavior and, and you know, was there any force, threat of force, coercion, or was the age difference so significant that this has now become a crime? Um, as a general rule, we kind of look in that four year age, age bracket. So if the kids are less than four years uh, apart and certain other criteria, I'm not gonna get into all the specifics, but um, two teenagers, two years apart, no, th no threats of force, coercion or anything. Um, and neither one of them are an adult probably not something that, that would fall under sex abuse. Um, so, but if you are not sure, by all means call us. We'll document it. Everything that gets called into Two for One Kids gets documented. Whether or not we take it as a report or not, your information will be in there forever and we'll be able to, you know, if you ever need um, to, you know, if you ever say, hey, I, I've called about this before, we'll be able to pull it right back up. Possible signs of child abuse. I do these because these are the things that we look for, but almost nothing on this list is something that's going to be, okay, they have this one, so that's absolutely child abuse. Because there's a lot of reasons why kids get injuries. We have to look at it, but these are some of the things that we look for. Um, bruises and burns, cuts and scars. Um, guys, I've had a kid that was at school. Um, I was a little unhappy about this. He had a black eye all day in school and nobody called us. Um, I had another one, had three cigarette burns and a cigar burn. Two of them were fresh, two of them were completely healed and old, all visible on his face and head. They kept changing schools, but if you see an old scar, a perfectly circular old scar, about three quarters, to, you know, one inch in diameter, that might be a cigarette burn. So that would be a time to call us we'll let you know if we've already investigated this and dealt with this issue. But if you see scars like that that are indicative of, of physical abuse, by all means call us. Um, they, may not be, they may be something that we have never heard of before. And if it left a scar, that was a significant enough injury um, that we would have taken it. Um, so looking at, at marks left by a gag or some form of restraint, um, guys, we get kids, I had two kids that were, uh, the parents' version of supervision was tying them to the high chair with uh, extension cords. So they had marks on their wrists from being restrained in the, um, in the, in the high chairs. And that would have been roughly your all's age to, to see those kids. Um, imprint injuries. I always tell people, the injuries left on kids from getting hit tend to look exactly like the thing they got hit with. So when you see three fingers, you know, it looks like, oh, that looks like a thumb and two fingers. They probably got hit with a hand. Every once in a while, I have to look at something a couple times to figure out what it is, but most of the time I can look at something and figure out exactly what the child got hit with. And I always tell people, when people start asking about discipline, we've already established it's, it's perfectly legal for parents to use physical discipline. Not a big fan of it myself, but I, it, it's legal, so I, I, I'm perfectly fine dealing with families that use it. Um, but I always advise to use the hand because, um, well, this is too small. Uh, a friend of mine had a case, the dad hit the kid with the remote for the TV. You have no idea when you're using an implement to hit a child, you have no idea how hard you're hitting because there's no feedback. You spank a kid on the butt with your hand, your hand hurts if you hit too hard, right? If you use an implement, you have no idea how hard somebody's hitting a child. So. I always advise if you're going to use discipline, physical discipline, um, don't use an implement. Again, it's not illegal to, but we advise strongly, and I give them lots of good reasons why. Um, missing teeth, and I will add something on this one. I had a kid on one of my caseloads, the, um, there was a really jagged, ugly scar going from the um, base of the nose down the lip. What do you think that would be, uh, uh, a scar there, what's that normally indicative of? Cleft palate, right? The surgery? Yeah, but this one was really ragged. It was kind of back and forth. It was not a good surgical scar. Nobody ever asked the kid what happened. She'd been kept out of school for probably weeks and weeks until it healed. Um, he, she got punched in the face and it split her lip from here all the way up to here. It was completely apart. And they taped it until it healed. So there was no stitching, no, no medical uh, care for that child. Um, again, just being observant, sitting in front of the class, you get to look at all their faces. You get to interact with the kids. 
just be observant. Um, spotty balding, we get kids that have their hair pulled out of their head. Um, so patches of missing hair. Um, eye injuries tend to be pretty common, um, having black eyes or the, uh, uh, sometimes when kids get hit really hard, the, the white of the eye, you'll see the sclera, it's got um, blood in it, and you'll see some red in the sclera where it's supposed to be white. Um, broken bones, obviously, you're not going to be detecting that, but you may see an arm or you may see a kid, especially a young nonverbal kid, that's not using a limb. They can't tell anybody, hey, my arm's broken. They just know, ow, it hurts, and I can't sit, tell anybody other than crying. So you see a kid that's, you know, tucking an arm in or, or not using part of their body, again, that's a good time to ask a question, you know, what's going on. Um, abrasions and scrapes. Do kids get abrasions and scrapes? At your age group, they're going to have lots of scuffs, right? Where do kids uh, normally get scuffed? Their knees. Their what? Elbows, yes. What we call um, bony protrusions. So things like the forehead, the nose, the jaw, the, you know, where anything that sticks out is where kids tend to fall and get hit and scuffed up. Um, shin bones. Um, so those, now, can a kid also get hit on those body parts? But again, injuries inflicted by uh, somebody hitting a child tend to look just like the thing they hit the kid with. Injuries from falling down and getting scuffed up on, on the pavement or something, they look like kind of nondescript, you know, what I call a scuff. They got a little road rash or a little, little abrasion. Um, bleeding from the ears, nose or mouth. Um, frequent UTIs, um, painful urination. Uh, abrasions, and, and what this says, abrasions, bleeding, or bruising in the genital area. Um, I'll also add any area that's protected. Um, when we fall, what do we do with our arms? We just go like this and fall and take it? We put our hands out here, right? We protect our torso. We protect some of these areas that are vital. So when somebody's getting hit under here, where it's normal to protect that area, or if they're getting hit and it's wrapping around to the inner, inside of the thigh, those are normally places that are protected. So if you're seeing bruises in unusual places where it doesn't make sense, now you have an injury that doesn't have a good story. Um, sudden difficulty walking or sitting, like I said, looking for any obvious sign that they're not walking right, they're not using a limb properly. So places that are normally accidental, we just talked about this. Um, the non-accidental injuries, they tend to happen in what we call a primary target zone. Back of the knees to the back of the neck. These are pretty common places for kids to get hit. Um, not that they can't get hit in other places, but typically those are some of the primary areas that we see. Um, indications that things are abusive versus accidental injuries. You tend to have uh, large numbers of injuries and they tend to be large in size and they happen, like I said, usually in locations where you're like, that doesn't really look like it could have happened that way. Um, one of my most common stories that I get for every skull fracture I've almost ever gone out on, fell off the couch. Okay, guys, couches are like 16 inches high and if there's padding underneath the plush carpet, that's not going to cause a subdural hematoma bleeding down deep inside the, uh, underneath the skull. So that's a story that doesn't match the injury. Um, this one is huge, medical care being delayed. If you see a kid with an injury that you think should have had medical care, and mom goes, oh no, I took care of it on my own. Had a kid with third degree burns on her hand, mom was a afraid to deal with the hospital and to possibly deal with us, so she withheld medical treatment. The burn itself was actually accidental. The kid stuck something in an outlet and was holding onto the metal and it burned deep into her hand, um, down through the muscle tissue. So it was a pretty deep third degree burn. Um, but she was so afraid of us that she delayed the medical care, which to us is a huge indicator that it's an abusive injury when they withhold medical care because they're either A, trying to figure out a good story to tell somebody, or B, crossing their fingers and praying that the injury heals on its own okay. So that's why they delay medical care a lot of times. Um, and again, the injuries show a pattern. Other bruises suggestive of injuries. Any bruise on an infant under nine months old. When do kids start cruising? Does anybody know what, anybody know what cruising is? Not quite crawling, it's a little higher than that. 
When they, uh, when they go up to the couch or the coffee table and they'll grab it and they'll pull themselves up to a standing position and then they'll do that little walk around like this, that sideways where they're holding on to stuff, we call that cruising. If they're crawling on the ground and they fall, how far are they actually falling? <laughs> you know, four, five, six inches, right? Is it possible to get a bruise from that little, I mean, maybe certain circumstances, but it's highly unlikely you're gonna have any kind of significant injury from a fall that size. So, but now they're standing up, now they can fall a little bit further. And if they hit something that's extremely hard or got a good hard edge on it, that can leave some injuries. But kids that are not cruising, we, the, we have a phrase we use, kids who aren't cruising shouldn't be bruising because they just haven't fallen far enough to, to get that. Um, again, bruises other than on those bony prominences, um, bruises on the ears, face, abdomen, buttocks, back, arms, thighs, hands and feet. Um, for little ones, one of the places that we get some normal, some, some good bruises is on the ear. Um, people grab kids by their ears and you'll have the bruise on this side and the bruise on the inside. Generally, that really it's hard to get bruises on both sides except by getting pinched and that's pretty much the, the most common form that we see. Um, I've had a few of those myself. Not on me, on kids on my caseload. Um, Patterned, symmetric, or bilaterally uh, located bruises. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had kids with injuries on two sides of the body, and the parent goes, he fell. Anybody know a problem with that? We don't bounce, <laughs> right? We don't hit the floor and then bounce up two feet and land on the other side. We tend to go thud and stay there and moan. So we don't, it's hard to get bruises on both sides of the body from an, a, a fall. The only exception to that would be maybe like a fall down the stairs or a ladder or something where you're going to hit multiple times on the way down. So again, looking at the story, looking at the injury, does this even make sense? Um, this one, I've got a few pictures in here. They are fairly typical cases for us, but they're probably not things that you're used to seeing. So um, this uh, little girl here. You can see some of the, the pattern bruising on her back. Um, first off, it's in a nice line, what we call a linear bruise, but it has a pattern to it here. Yeah, it kind of matches the pattern on that belt over there. It has those metal studs on it. Um, kids, probably the most common implements that kids get hit with these days are um, uh, the electrical, the, the cords from an Xbox or, or the Time Warner cable box, and even worse than that, the cell phone charging cords. The thinner they get, the more likely they are to uh, cut the skin. Um, you know, a paddle is four inches wide generally and, and covers a large surface area. It doesn't tend to break the skin. It can leave a good bruise. Um, but these cords that people are using nowadays a lot are so thin. It's kind of like when women are wearing high heels. All that force is concentrated on that real small spot. So when they use a, a cord, all that force is concentrated in that little looped section, and it tends to cut the skin like this did here. Um, he got hit, I don't know if you can see, it's three times um, from different angles on there. Um, anybody know, anybody take a guess at what he got hit with? Perfect handprint on there. And you can see finger, 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 finger. Palm of his hand was here on his cheek. Um, anybody take a guess at one of the most common reasons uh, um, little kids get hit? Crying. crying. How often do kids cry each day? A, lot. <laughs> a whole heap. <laughs> um, average, I think, is between three and four hours a day kids cry. That's just your normal, typical kid. Anybody dealt with a colicky kid? <laughs> then you really saw the, yeah. the long days. <laughs> Um, yeah, they seem to like never stop and there's no reason for it. You can feed them, you can change them, you can, you know, rock them, you can do whatever you want and they will still cry forever. So crying, people get very frustrated at crying. Um, probably one of the most uh, other common reasons for real serious injuries is potty training accidents. People getting very frustrated at, at, at trying to potty train a kid. What's a common, a good age to start potty training a kid? when they have verbal skills, right? When you can communicate and, you know, 
that's the bathroom, that's where you go and, and you know, be able to have good communication back and forth. So yeah, three is a good age. Um, we have folks that are absolutely trying to get their kids potty trained by 12 to 18 months. How frustrating do you think that's going to be for a parent? Very unrealistic expectations that are not going to get met most of the time. Um, now, I did have one grandma on my case load that was Johnny on the spot. She had the kid, no diaper on, and she was very in a very non-stressful way, just, you know, literally every five minutes. She's just taking the kid to the bathroom and making a game of it. But she had no job. She was a stay-at-home grandma, and she now had the kids in her care, and she wanted that kid potty trained. Um, why do parents want their kids potty trained quickly? They don't have to buy diapers. That's a huge expense. What's the other one? Well, changing diapers gets, yeah, old for everybody. How about getting kids in daycares? They can't get them in the daycare. For a lot of these daycares, they won't take them if they're still in diapers. So there's a lot of stress on them to get that done quickly, way too quick. Oh, you know, I guess I should have uh, used that slide and asked you what the uh, injury was for. I forgot my coworker put that on there. Duh. All right. Um, we talked about injuries to kids' ears um, and missing hair, scratches from fingernails. Um, that is obviously, you know, the kid got pinched by the ear, and this is the fingernail scratch that occurred there. This is kind of faded. Um, that's the bottom of the kid's foot. It's a thumbprint from grabbing the kid by his foot and pulling him. So again, all these little bruises in places that are fairly protected, right? I mean, we don't tend to get too many gashes behind my ear back here. I'd have to be shaving really poorly that day. Um, cigarette burns. Um, used to be a lot more common. We kind of go through phases. There, there are some years that I had some and some years that I didn't see any at all. Um, can cigarette burns happen accidentally? Absolutely. Um, you got those little two and three year olds running around at, at picnics and stuff. And what do people do with their cigarettes? And they walk around like this with them in their hands, right at shoulder and face level for these little two year olds. So they tend to, they, they can get burned. The burns that are tend to be accidental are more comet shaped. They're kind of elongated because it's kind of like brushed and, and going on by. Still burns, still leaves, but it tends to be real shallow and it tends to be, like I said, more oblong or, or comet shaped. Burns that are deeper, perfectly symmetrical, tend to be things that people purposefully did pushing in. Um, this one here, um, whoops, that's from a, um, uh, an iron. Um, but it doesn't actually look like an iron burn. It, it, I had to get the full story to, to figure it out. Um, he held the iron above the kid's leg and hit the steam button. So this is because the baby was crying too much. So this is burned. Whoops. Wow. <laughs> Didn't mean to do that. Um, this is all burned up here. This is where the steam went up underneath the shirt. So that's why I couldn't figure out what this was at first until law enforcement did their interview and we figured out that he held the, the iron above. And again, this is for crying excessively. Well, actually he was crying just about, she was crying just about as much as a normal baby would. He just wasn't able to deal with it. Um, now this one was the father, which is um, about, I think 30, 35% of the time when we have serious injuries like this, anybody take a guess at who did it? Mom's boyfriend. Mom's boyfriend, not biological dad. That tends to be a, a, a pretty successful starting point. A lot of times we, um, we look at somebody who doesn't have the emotional attachment to the child, who's easily frustrated, doesn't have that bond, um, because things like this can happen. Um, this is the kid I told you about that spent all day in school with a black eye and nobody did anything, nobody called us. So that was a pretty significant black eye. Um, I could see that literally from here to the back table. I could go, hmm, you have a black eye. So pretty significant, uh, hard to miss. Um, little girl on the other side here, it was a handprint. And that's what we call petechiae. We put this picture in because it, it looks a little different than a regular bruise. Petechiae, anybody done um, pointillism? Like when you were in junior high art class, 
You take a pen and you make these little uh, pictures out of little points. Same kind of thing. They're small, minute bruises. Um, they just, uh, a lot of times they can be from either from choking or a slap that kind of um, uh, is more of an ab abrasive uh, across the face versus the impact going directly in. Um, and you can get some of these, what we call petechial hemorrhaging. Yeah. Hmm. I, I mean, I'm a. If there's a medical condition that, that would cause that in an adult, I, it, it wouldn't be something. Okay. And is it primarily in the legs, or is it any anywhere in the body? I haven't dealt with any like that, and I, I, I hadn't heard that until now, so good, good to know. Um, are any of you going to be doing any type of home visits, going out to the field to, to see folks? Some of y'all will be, okay. Um, we look for things, when we walk through homes, we look for any safety threat in the home. Um, home could be the home condition itself is um, filthy and a hazard to the child. Um, it could be something like this. These are, I forget how many stab marks there are in the door. It's from that knife down there. Um, you walk into a door and there's 20 stab marks on the other side of the door. What do you think that might be indicative of? Domestic violence. Somebody's out of control in that home. Somebody is extremely violent and has no control over their anger in that home. And that's a concern. Normal people don't just pick up a knife and stab their door 20 times. That's a metal door and that's, that's kind of hard to you know, push that knife blade through there. So uh, again, things that we just, we walk into a home and we look around. One of, one of my more interesting domestic violence visits, I was looking for a caretaker for the child because of the domestic violence, and I was in the home of a relative, and I just looked over on the refrigerator, and there was a court subpoena for a case. And I looked at it and I was like, well, why, who's getting subpoenaed to court and what's that for? And I can't remember whether they admitted it to me or I looked it up, but it was for a domestic violence case between those two folks. So again, just being observant, looking around, you see all kinds of things. Um, drugs left laying out accessible to kids, crack pipes left laying around, anything that would be an, uh, you know, a hazard to a child. Um, also some of the hazards that we look for in the home, the actual conditions, broken out windows with, with ex, um, exposed uh, shards of glass still hanging in them. Um, uh, obviously things like feces throughout the home and, and uh, um, electrical wires that are exposed. Um, those are some of the basic ones that we look for. Old rotting food laying on the floor, pills laying all over the place. Um, so possible signs of sex abuse, and I'm going to say the same thing about this that I said about the signs of physical abuse. We look for all these, but just because a child has some of these symptoms doesn't mean they've been sexually abused. The only way to verify that is by talking to the kid and, and, and getting a history of sex abuse from the child. Um, and we're going to talk about that just a little bit here. Um, so acting out in inappropriate sexual ways with uh, toys or objects, nightmares, sleeping problems, um, becoming very withdrawn, clingy, and I'm not going to go through every single one of these. I'm going to go through some of the, uh, the common ones. Um, bedwetting, regressing to, to uh, younger behaviors, um, unaccountable fear for a particular person or place, um, self-harm, uh, not wanting to be alone with a particular individual, um, new words for body parts and uh, no obvious source for these. Um, everything on here can also be a sign of other emotional problems going on. It, it, it does, you could have a family member who was very close to them pass away and you can see some of these symptoms. You can have domestic violence in the home and see all of these symptoms. So they're not specific to just sex abuse. 
But what I try to look for is what this, is the child's normal, typical behavior, and now what's changed? What am I seeing that's changed? Because anything from their base, what I call their baseline, that changes, there's a reason for it usually. You know, did they meet a new friend? Did they have a new girlfriend? Did they have uh, a new guy? In the, uh, did mom bring a new guy to the house that they don't like? There's something that's been introduced. Um, when we're looking at child sexual behavior, one of the biggest problems we deal with these days is how accessible sex abuse or um, uh, sexual information is available to kids. I mean, regular TV, you can see just about anything on regular TV these days, and some of our parents don't use the best judgment in what shows to, to have on for our kids. So they get exposed to a lot more these days than they probably did in my generation. We didn't even have the internet. I did not use a computer until I went to college. No, my senior year in high school, I used a computer once. Yeah, I'm old. All right, um, adult behaviors to look for. Um, refusing to allow a child sufficient privacy uh, or to make uh, their own decisions on personal matters. Um, over, overly interested in the sexual development of a child or teenager. It's, all, it's always something to look for. Um, spending a lot of their spare time with uh, children and having very little interest in spending time with people their own age. Again, these are all things that we look for. None of this by themselves means that they're a sex offender, but it's behavior that we're looking for. Yeah? Is there a point where, because I know more and more I'm hearing that uh, parents are watching, or caregivers are watching porn with the child in the room? I mean, is that to me is sexual abuse. Is that all under mandated reporting? There is a crime called disseminating matter harmful to a juvenile. And if a parent is in the privacy of their own bedroom or the study and they're watching something and a child accidentally walks in or wakes up in the middle of the night and comes in their room and observes what they're seeing, you know, what the parent is viewing. Not good judgment, accidental, I've never seen anybody consider that a crime. If you have the parent watching it in the living room while the kids are awake and foot traffic through the living room back and forth from the kitchen to their bedrooms, and it is very likely or it's just an absolute certainty that the kids are viewing this, that's, that would fall under disseminating matter harmful to a juvenile. Um, definitely a, a criminal uh, act and many times could be something for us to be involved in. Um, defining a neglected child. When we talk about neglect, we, we talk a lot about basic needs. And anybody take a stab at what some of the basic needs of a child are? Food, got to eat, right? Shelter. Clothing. They don't have to have a bed, but we definitely have to have a safe place for them to sleep, their, their home, their shelter, whatever it is. Um, and supervision tends to be a, a, a big topic for us. Um, anybody know what, what age group a kid's allowed to be left home alone? 14? That would be, that'd be a good age. 10 would be, I, I would be happy with 10. Um, 10 was what it was on the military bases, where I grew up on military bases around the world, and there's a law that says no child under the age of 10 will be left home alone. It's a Department of Defense um, law, so it falls under the Universal Code of Military Justice. Unfortunately, in the state of Ohio, there is no law that says what age a child can be left home alone. There isn't a law that says what age but there is a law if parents use poor judgment in that age, and that's the child endangering statute. So it's not that they can't be charged for leaving a young child home alone, it's just that nobody has said this is the age. So what that means is it can be different for different children. We can have this kid here who's 11 years old who is um, maybe cognitively a little delayed, and maybe, or maybe their behavior is very out of control, history of fire setting, history of other, and maybe that child is not able to be left home alone. Where you may have a 10 year old who is cognitively on target, very personable, good behavior, who's absolutely fine to be home alone for an hour or two after school. Um, anybody know what latchkey age kids are? Where do we consider kids to be latchkey age? Well, down to about third grade level. So what are we talking about, about nine-year-olds? So if a kid is nine years old and he's home alone after school for an hour and a half and there's no cognitive delays, no, no significant behavior problems, 
Um, he's not afraid to be left home alone after school. Um, and we go through a lot of different questions when we, I get people asking me this question all the time. My response at that point would be, it sounds, you know, if, if all of those things are okay, it sounds like something that we would not investigate as a report of abuse and neglect. Now that same nine-year-old home alone at 11 o'clock at night who's scared to be home alone, that's gonna be a problem. Um, so we look at the age, the development of the child, the time of day, the length of time, and do they have access to some adult, either by phone or somebody in their apartment building that they've got as a, you know, we look at all of those things to decide is this appropriate or not. Um, and it's a big curve. We start at nine for latchkey, and as they get older, and it, we could foresee that they could be there later in the evening. What is a good age to babysit? 14, again, that'd be a good age. Um, I would never use anybody under 16 myself as a babysitter for my kid, but um, the Red Cross starts certifying kids to babysit at age 11. Yeah, it's pretty young, it's pretty young. That being said, yeah, you have a question? And I'll even get a little more specific than that. An 11-year-old watching, let's just say they're watching a five-year-old after school for a couple hours till about 6.30, 7 o'clock when mom gets home from, from work. Does that sound like a problem with anybody? All things being equal, there's no delays, there's no behavior problems, there's no medical concerns, everything, nobody's afraid to be there. 11-year-old watching a five-year-old for a few hours after school. Anybody got a problem with that? What about an 11-year-old watching a uh, one, two, three, and six-year-old until midnight? Okay, somewhere in there is the line, and we have to gather all of those little details, which is why we ask so many questions at the hotline level, to get all those details to decide what's appropriate for this kid and should we be involved with this. Um, it's, a, it's a hard question to ask because nobody will put down an age. And if they did put down an age, and then you have a situation, I, I had one case where we couldn't get a criminal conviction because there was a 19-year-old there. But the 19-year-old the five-year-old was more cognitively functioning than the higher cognitively functioning than the 19-year-old. The 19-year-old wasn't even verbal, but we could not get a criminal conviction on it because he was 19. To me, that and everybody here, it sounds like you know it doesn't make sense. But Ohio has some of the <laughs> most vague statutes when it comes to child abuse and neglect, and we really we struggle at times. Um, I think we do a pretty good job of being consistent at Children's Services. I think when it comes time for um, law enforcement and, and criminal court, I think you start involving so many people. I mean, with us, there's 250 of us. With law enforcement, there's 1,000 Cincinnati police officers. Take that all the way out to the edges of the county, and you're talking probably tens of thousands, you know, at least 10,000 officers. And every one of them is going to have a little different idea on what they think is appropriate gets a little harder then to get on the same page. Um, as far as uh, the rest of the neglect things, what about somebody, is, uh, somebody who is going from house to house, what we call couch surfing? They move three times in six months, going from grandma's house to the aunt's house to their best friend's house, but they still keep the kids in school. They still feed the kids. Does anybody think those kids are being neglected? I wouldn't consider it neglect. Do I think it's impairing their schooling? Absolutely. Every move that kids do, how, how far back does that set them in school? Four to six months. Every time they move, it's going to set them back. So if they're having multiple moves, it is going to affect their schooling. But if the parent is doing their best, making sure the kids have a safe place to sleep, and still getting them to that school, we are probably not going to be involved in that.